I think we are live, so we can certainly start uh, our uh, discussion and conversation. Uh, thank you very much for being us, uh, 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 with us today. And welcome to the seventh episodes of the AIA MSME Talks. I'm Julia Maria Marsan, Director for Strategy and Partnership at AIA. And we have the privilege to have with us uh, a, a, a panel of uh, great speakers that I will introduce very shortly. Um, today, we will discuss uh, micro firms. Uh, as many of us know, uh, micro firms have often specific challenges due to their very limited size. For instance, they find it difficult to get training because all people working in the firm are indispensable and cannot be replaced uh, on that specific day or hour. It can also be difficult to scale up and upgrade their activities, for instance, through better management skills or the adoption of new technologies uh, and innovation. Of course, uh, on average, there are great exceptions, clearly. Um, and this is why there is a lot of attention in policy circles all around the world on how to make micro firms grow and scale up. And even if there is no magic recipe, we will discuss today precisely these issues with our experts and also about the different challenges and opportunities. Let me remind you to please uh, mute your microphone throughout the webinar to avoid background noises. But please uh, feel free to interact with us uh, in any way you want throughout uh, the chat box to leave us ideas, comments, and also questions, because we will get back to your questions during the Q&A session towards the end uh, of this webinar. But now it's time to uh, start introducing the speakers and then immediately start the conversation. We are very pleased to have with us uh, uh, Arief Imran. He's the group CEO of Serv uh, from Malaysia. Serv is a vehicle super app, an internet-based technology platform that focuses on providing a one-stop vehicle ownership management experience. Uh, Arief has uh, uh, over 10 years of experience as an entrepreneur. He founded several companies such as the Daga Group and Star Gym. He has led Serve into an innovative partnership with Grab, uh, Boost, and MyAssist. Uh, and he's also in the midst of widening the range of services such as autonomous vehicle and automotive-related technology, as well as expanding Serve throughout the region. Welcome and thank you very much, Arief, uh, for being with us. Many thanks also to Simon Su, founder of Track and Roll for, from uh, uh, Brunei. Uh, we are very happy as this is the first time that we have a Brunei entrepreneur in our series, so we are very excited about that. He's a serial entrepreneur and four times uh, the recipient of the Brunei ICT Award since 2000. Simon's latest startup is Track and Roll. It aims at developing, uh, delivering a truly modern, simple to use and cost-effective cloud-based human resource management solution to all SMEs in the Asia market. He's a seasoned entrepreneur, well experienced, and deeply passionate about startup development. And uh, uh, he has a strong desire to give back to the community through supporting young entrepreneurship development. Thank you very much, Simon. We're also very happy to have uh, with us today uh, Marco Marchese, who is a technical specialist on SME policies and uh, at the Enterprise Department of the ILO, the International Labor Organization where he works on the analysis of national business environment reform and productivity enhancing policies for the SME sector. Prior to joining the ILO, ILO, he spent 13 years at the OECD, where he managed a number of country reviews on SME and entrepreneurship policies, for instance, uh, of Vietnam, Indonesia, and Brazil, uh, and also thematic projects on SME productivity, high growth firms, and local entrepreneurship policies. He has been a Fulbright Scholar at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, the MIT, and holds a master's degree in development economics from the University of Rome, Tor Vergata. Thank you so much, Marco. It's a pleasure to see you with us. And also, uh, we are very happy to welcome back uh, our colleague from area, uh, Dr. Don Tintan Ha, because this is the second time she participates in this series, and we are very happy about it. Uh, her research interests include industrial organization, international trade, labor market, and income distribution. 
Uh, she has conducted uh, several projects on research-based policy uh, at area, focusing on trade facilitation, economic integration, globalization and firms' behavior, the participation in global value chains and labor market outcome, technology exposure and employment, productivity, and much more. And now she's also running a capacity building program in collaboration with ANCDAD for ASEAN government officials. And before joining AIA, she was a research associate at the Asian Development Bank Institute in Tokyo. Thank you very much, Ha. So we can now start uh, uh, the conversation uh, with uh, the speakers. And uh, let's start with our two entrepreneurs. I would ask them to give us a brief introduction of their business and also the existing business climate in their respective countries. And then to share uh, also with us uh, some regional perspective uh, uh, from the perspective of their firms. And let's start this round with uh, IF. Uh, please, the floor is yours. All right, hi, uh, thank you, Gulia, and uh, thank you everyone uh, for joining. So first of all, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Arif, I'm the uh, co-founder and CEO of uh, Offserve Group. So basically, uh, I would like to just share uh, how uh, do we started uh, back then. So Surf is as a, uh, how do we get the name? It's actually from the purpose of to serve people. So, uh, but because of S-E-R-V-E, I couldn't uh, register as a brand. So I just uh, took out the E and then it becomes self as -E uh, But how do we serve the people? So basically by, uh, by innovation and technology uh, to look into improving people's life and solving the problems using technology. And we started to dive and uh, look into uh, which, uh, which uh, vertical or which industry, which, uh, which cluster that we should uh, go deep into innovations, right? Uh, to solve uh, their problem, to, to solve customers' problem. So we find out that actually automotive and mobility uh, is the industry or the, the, the sector that have the most sign in the market. So a lot of problems, a lot of uh, sign in the market, uh, transparency issue and everything. So we are being called to uh, look into it and then let's uh, innovate and create some stuff, right? To solve the, the user's problem. So that's how we started uh, back then. So uh, our solution is actually, uh, we call it as a vehicle a super app, a vehicle ownership experience. How do we define it from the moment that you, before you own a vehicle, you own it, uh, anything record keeping, everything is digital and we connect uh, to a lot of merchant or service providers in the market. So basically before this, it's kind of, uh, I would say a different world. Uh, the users themselves, the vehicle owners themselves, and the providers in the merchant, workshops, service centers, accessories, car wash and all that. So it's kind of different world, different language, right? Different, different tone and all that. So because of this uh, miscommunication and misunderstanding or misinformation, it come out that a lot of intransparency or, or, or problems uh, popping up in the market. So what we do is that we're trying to use technology or innovation to be the intermediary, to be in the middle of them. So how do we take care of uh, interaction between these two? Uh, how do we digest information from the providers? And how do we show it to the users? How we digest back the information from the users? How we show it to the, to the, to the providers? So that's how our technology is all about. And uh, whatever before this, uh, all this service record, service book is being recorded manual. Every invoicing receipt, everything is still handwritten. So we started to move to have a move of digitalization uh, in the industry. So everything should go digital. Every invoices, receipt, uh, service book, record keeping can be trackable back uh, from the user, the vehicle owners app, from the user app. So that's what we do. And uh, we uh, are available. So uh, our existence, our presence uh, is actually not just in Malaysia. We started in Malaysia, but uh, starting from these few months back, uh, actually uh, as officially it is this month. So we just rolled out our, sol our solution in the US, uh, in Texas uh, as, as specifically. Uh, so what uh, effort that we do uh, in uh, this recent uh, pandemic, right? So we kind of rolled out uh, a free solution uh, for every of these uh, small and micro businesses. 
So you know that there are few categories. I would say there are three tiers uh, in in uh, service service industry of automotive. One is the tier one, which is the big the big guys, uh, officials, uh, authorized service centers, and all that. The second one are the unauthorized service centers, but uh, they are more well equipped uh, or uh, well look. I mean, I mean the outlet is is more is is more beautiful, uh, more well equipped, and then they have they have they have more fun. They have more resources in terms of that. And we have uh, the third one, which is the uh, the uh, I would say the 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 under three kind of thing. So the small businesses. So this is the low hanging fruit means uh, the one that we really look into uh, the movement of digitalization after the impact of the pandemic. So how do we kind of try to accelerate the adoption and all that to have their platform, to have their booking system, uh, to have uh, to, to make them be able to be booked uh, by our app and being paid by contactless payment through our app. So that's what we do actually. Thank you very much, uh, Arief. So now, now let's move to get the point of view of Simon. Simon, the floor is yours. Simon, please unmute yourself. OK. Hi. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Simon. And I'm very happy for the invitation. And I'm from Brunei. Um, so Brunei is just around Asia, right? But I think it's not something that everyone's talk about uh, or everyone know about Brunei, except for the oil and gas things. So, uh, but we're, we're alive and kicking, right? So my, myself, I have been an entrepreneur since year 2000. And uh, this is actually my third startup. Uh, all this time, I've been into the tech space, the web, uh, the web and the e-commerce and all that thing. So both of them has been acquired before. So this is my third one. So um, like any entrepreneurs, we are always constantly challenging ourselves to like, what, what can we do next, right? Um, so the market that I'm seeing in Brunei in particularly was that uh, though the whole world would have been going digitized and everything's on the, on the enterprise levels, but Brunei is still very manual. So, uh, so the moment I relate back to where we are and what kind of challenges we face, we realize that like almost 60% of most of the SME is still actually still doing a lot of their HR admins work manually. And the best friend would be their pen and papers and then Excel. So, and this is not just an isolated uh, event for Brunei. So we, the, the more research we do, like actually regionally in Malaysia, Indonesia, and a lot of our regional countries, a lot of SME is still having that issues. So what is some of the reason that is like slowing them down from going digital? So one of the three things that I, we recognized was that, uh, first of all, a HR solution compared to any other enterprise solutions is not the easiest uh, solution to be found on the market, right? Uh, from like accounting and all that, there are plenty of them, but in, in terms of HR, there are not so much. Uh, and the second one, most of them that is in the market was basically very uh, legacy, I would put it, like uh, off the shelf and all that thing. So they are not easy to use, right? Uh, you subscribe, uh, you buy it off one time and then you have to learn the process of using it. And then the third, which is the most important one is that they are actually pretty pricey for off the shelf or a standalone products. Uh, it can go up to 50, 000, 50 Brunei thousand dollars to 200 to half a meal like SAP and all that thing. So that's one of the main reason that a lot of SMB or the smaller company do not uh, able to afford technology leverage in terms of like uh, enterprise solution. <clears throat> so that's why we decided to go online and bring everything onto a cloud base, uh, which can be shared to everyone to use. So that's our origins of our, uh, our uh, initiative of, of starting these things. Uh, the, so uh, the product has just uh, has been started building for two years. And then this year's by right is the time that we go onto the market on, in terms of commercialization. But who knows, right? Uh, uh, COVID starts at the beginning of the years. So that affects everything uh, on the commercialization go live period. And uh, that's actually a big hit to us because in terms of our uh, financial projection, everything's, uh, the burn rate should stop by early this year and it should start coming to commercialize and money supposed to come in. 
So uh, two challenges that we found them. Uh, one of the well, first thing, first one, just like I, I think most of uh, any business, when you come in, you would think that everyone would, you are designing something for everyone that should be able to jump boat and start using a product. And obviously that's not the ideal case. And we learned a lot of things uh, along the way. And obviously the second challenge is like in COVID time, everyone is being very careful with their spending. So that again, uh, uh, slow down the whole pace of uh, adoption in the market. Yeah, so, but thankfully, I mean, to uh, a little bit about Brunei situation, Brunei has, uh, Brunei government have been doing a really good job. And we've been COVID free for, I think about 160 days now. So internally within Brunei, we are doing pretty fine. Yeah, uh, at least domestic uh, operation, commercialization, everything is, is back on, on track, just that we can't go out. Yeah, so that's what happened to us. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, now let's get the perspective from Ha. Uh, and Ha, I would ask you, what can you tell us about business demography in ASEAN? What is the balance across lar large, small and micro firms? And are these patterns very different across ASEAN countries? How the floor is yours. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Julia, for the invitation to join. Um, regarding the, the business demography in ASEAN, um, I think perhaps a very common picture that um, is not surprising to you that is that uh, the SME sector account for the majority of firms in the economy. Um, on average in ASEAN countries, uh, the SME sector account for about 97 to 99% of the enterprise population uh, where the data is available. And the SME sector tends to be dominated by micro enterprises, which typically account for about 85% to up to 99% of the total number of enterprises in each country. And there is a relatively low share of medium-sized enterprises, which um, meaning that um, it's, we call it a kind of missing middle in the region's productive structure. Uh, the, the second feature about the demography of business in ASEAN is the significant contribution of SME sector to job creation. Um, in most ASEAN countries, SMEs are mostly found in labor intensive sector with low value added, uh, for example, particularly in retail trade, agriculture activities. Uh, so they continue account to account for a quite high share of employment, but low share of gross value added. On average, uh, SMEs in the region account for about 66% of employment and about 40% of gross value added. And about 70% of formal SMEs are engaged in labor intensive services with only 10 to 15% engaged in manufacturing. And the third feature we observe is the very low participation in the global market. Uh, SMEs in general appear to be underrepresented as exporters with the contribution to total exports of around 10 to 30%. Uh, the use of imported inputs is also limited. For example, in Indonesia, only 1.6% of firms use imported inputs compared to 45% of firms in Malaysia or 24% in Vietnam. Now, one important aspect of firm demography is the entry, exit, and, su uh, and survival of the firms, uh, the factors that affect the firm's survival. However, due to the data limitation, I don't have much information about this pattern in ASEAN, but uh, for example, we have this information for Vietnam um, and we observe a, a large dynamics in terms of entry, survival and exit, meaning that each year there's a large number of new firms entering the market and at the same time the proportion of exit firms is also remarkable. For Vietnam it's around 12 uh, to 14 percent annually and the survival duration is quite short. Uh, over, overall, it's about um, three years. So an average firm can survive only three years in the market. And uh, the, this number of SMEs should be even smaller. And uh, um, amid the COVID-19 pandemic, the um, exit rate is also uh, much higher. In, in Vietnam, for example, um, in a 
recently released um, report, um, the temporary operation increased, um, the, the number of firms that temporarily ceased operation increased by about 80% compared to the corresponding period last year. And of course, we observe uh, differences across ASEAN countries. Some, in some countries, the SMEs tend to uh, contribute more to employment, like in Indonesia, uh, in Cambodia, in Laos, in Thai, where the uh, contribution of SMEs to employment account for around 80%. In some other countries, it's lower, like in Vietnam, it's about 64% or 65% in Malaysia and in Brunei about 54%. Uh, but overall, we observe that SMEs contribute significantly to job creation and they are more vulnerable and with a very high exit uh, and entry rate. So that's uh, some, a few notes that I'd like to make. Thank you very much, Ha, for framing uh, the conversation with this very relevant uh, data on business demographics in the region. Uh, now let's move uh, uh, to Marco. Um, so Marco, you have an extensive experience uh, on policies to support micro and small medium enterprises, uh, acquire both working in developed and developing countries. What can you tell us about the main challenges for micro firms? And how do you think these challenges uh, are being affected by the pandemic? Uh, the floor is yours, Marco. Yeah, uh, thank you, Julia. So let me say that um, I think, generally speaking, uh, the, the, um, the challenges that uh, micro-enterprises, uh, which are usually defined as companies with uh, less than uh, five or 10 employees, depending on the countries, are the same as the challenges that uh, uh, small enterprise or even medium enterprise face, but of course, in a much more uh, accentuated uh, uh, way. I will frame like the main challenges in terms of uh, three uh, problems of uh, uh, access, uh, which are basically in terms of access to skills, uh, access to finance and access uh, uh, to markets. So when we talk about entrepreneurship, I think uh, we would always uh, love to talk about the successful, like fast growing uh, uh, successful entrepreneurs. But the reality is that uh, uh, a very high proportion of companies are created uh, by people who lack uh, other opportunities uh, in, the, uh, in the job market. That is what we normally call uh, necessity-based uh, entrepreneurship. And this explains why uh, what we observe is that, uh, so these people start a business not because they really have a good idea, but because essentially uh, it's a way to, uh, to, to, to provide themselves with uh, a source of income. And uh, what we see is that, um, uh, and this also explains why one out of two uh, companies uh, die, uh, at least in OECD countries, uh, but the statistics is uh, probably the same in, uh, uh, in the Asian region and in emerging economies, they die within the first uh, uh, two years. So basically only one out of two companies survive the first, uh, uh, the first two years. And uh, the reason is that most of these companies start in, uh, in sectors where uh, entry costs uh, are lower. So they lack the skills uh, and therefore they lack the finance and therefore they start in sectors where entry costs are lower, such as retail trade, where uh, uh, competition is also very uh, fierce and, uh, and uh, merciless. Uh, so the first point, the first real like, key challenge is this lack of uh, skills, uh, which include both uh, managerial skills and, uh, and technical uh, uh, and technical skills. And we have also studies, I mean, very famous studies by uh, very renowned professor like uh, Nicholas Bloom at Stanford University that showed this very well uh, using uh, uh, the word management service. And that showed that, for example, like one of the reasons, one of the factors explaining like the worst performance of uh, uh, middle income economies uh, compared to uh, high income economies is that uh, uh, middle income economies, such as many in the Asian regions, Malaysia, Indonesia, Vietnam, uh, they have a higher share of uh, uh, badly performed uh, uh, firms. And this is using like the world management survey uh, data set, which is being uh, not, uh, increasingly used. The second problem is in terms of access to finance. And of course, it is a consequence of the lack of skills. So because uh, uh, micro entrepreneurs very often, they don't have enough technical skills and managerial skills, 
and the start in sectors where competition is fierce and where uh, growth opportunities are limited, uh, they find it much more difficult to get uh, uh, access to finance. Uh, not only, of course, equity finance, but also simple uh, traditional bank loans, debt finance. And that explains why uh, many of the policies in place to support micro enterprises, small enterprises as well, uh, are the traditional uh, uh, loan guarantees and subsidized credit, precisely because uh, micro enterprises find it very difficult to get uh, uh, loans. Then the government intervenes by uh, filling this void and helping them with, uh, with, uh, with some credit. Uh, because also, I mean, in addition to getting uh, to, to funding uh, difficult uh, to get credit, loan conditions are also uh, very often uh, tight. The third problem, uh, uh, again, it's uh, access to markets. And uh, I wouldn't spend so much time on it, but essentially, it's really a consequence of the first two, uh, two points. So I'm not talking about the um, international market, but simply uh, domestic uh, domestic market. Again, uh, very often micro enterprise operate in sectors where there is an oversupply of companies offering the same products and the same services. And as a result, uh, a key uh, problem these companies find is to uh, find their niche, you know, to find like their uh, to, to differentiate themselves from, uh, from the rest. Um, I will just quickly touch on the last part of your question, how the pandemic has affected uh, the, this, uh, this, uh, these problems. Well, it has affected, of course, uh, all of them in, uh, and it has compounded them. Uh, access to finance, we, know, we all know that uh, uh, the crisis has caused uh, a liquidity problem. And of course, this is affecting especially the micro enterprise and all the more so in uh, uh, middle income economies and emerging economies where the governments didn't have the fiscal space, the fiscal revenues to put in place the policies that uh, uh, high income economies uh, uh, did. Uh, it has caused the, uh, it has shown even more like the problem of access to skills because micro enterprise very often didn't have like, for example, the digital skills needed uh, to weather uh, the crisis. Uh, for example, uh, entering uh, using e-commerce to expand markets or using uh, remote uh, working uh, to cope with the lockdown and so on. So uh, again, the, 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 the pandemic has, uh, uh, has compounded this problem. And the pandemic has compounded also the problem of access to markets because we all know that now we live in what uh, the economist has called uh, uh, the 90% economy. But the reality is that it's 90% economy overall, but in certain sectors, 100% like manufacturing. But in many sectors where micro enterprises are overrepresented, we can say it's a 50% economy. If we think about restaurants or like basic services, here like the demand has really dropped by half. And this, of course, has impacted the disproportionately uh, micro enterprises. So I will stop there. Thank you very much, uh, Marco. Also, to uh, talking about uh, you know these other. Uh part of the picture. We are privileged because during this series uh, we typically discuss with very successful entrepreneurs, but clearly there are many that are struggling, especially in the current uh, times. So now let's uh, uh, continue with the second round of questions and let's start again with our uh, entrepreneurs. So I would ask uh, them to share their thoughts about uh, what small businesses, in particular very small businesses, uh, need to do to remain agile and resilient, especially now and in the post-pandemic future. And especially to share some ideas uh, linked to the specific sectors in which they operate. And also to tell us something about uh, public-private partnerships uh, in their respective countries. And let's start uh, this round with Simon. Simon, please unmute your microphone again. Yeah. Uh, am I? On, you, on we can we can hear you now. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, uh, your first question again is like on how how does micron businesses right? Uh, okay. So I would just say on behalf of um, the company that I myself is um, because currently we only have about like nine people and then the the. The kind of target market that we are really driven to to go for is anything between uh, the range of five to 
50 to 100, right? So in Brunei, uh, the definition of SME is slightly different because Brunei have only got a population of about 400 plus uh, thousand people. So when we talk about my, uh, SME, that would be ranging from uh, estimate about 20 to about 100, 150, that's SME. Uh, but like what uh, Michael was saying is, uh, or, or uh, one of the six speakers was saying, that is a lot of the, the SME is considered to be in the micron level, which is the between one to five people, right? So um, in Brunei scenario, uh, it was actually not too bad. Um, the lock, we never really got to the lockdown level. So uh, the highest that we go, I think in terms of the infection was concurrently about 19 people or to like 30, you know, 30 people around that. So, um, but it does, uh, as a small communities, uh, news like that will definitely shock a lot of people. Uh, and uh, panic buying and all that thing is definitely something that's going on. So uh, when it comes to business decision makings, um, a lot of them uh, definitely been uh, heavily affected because um, uh, even though there's no lockdown, but people here do not go out a lot, right? So a lot of uh, food businesses and other things um, goes down. And uh, the bigger one would have the bigger impact. Like right? people who, who own the franchise, those, those I think affected the most. Uh, but what's uh, interesting that comes up from the whole exercise was that um, it actually give a very, I think it's a very timely thing for Brunei. Uh, we in Brunei have been talking about digitization for many, many years. And uh, uh, with the initiative that is driven from uh, SME or enterprise like us, uh, it, it can never go the distance unless the government is doing something to to go to support this initiative. And this is the first time that I think uh, the whole country was in sync and uh, government was really pushing for uh, like uh, Industrial Revolution 4.0, though we may not be even in the 3.0 area, but this, this time it pushed everyone, every sector, uh, every government, uh, sectors, uh, enterprise, everyone was like pushing it really hard. And we see a very, very significant uh, boost in terms of digitization in the country. Uh, and it also uh, helps a lot of people in the e-commerce area as well. So my previous uh, startup was actually an e-commerce store, which is started in 2010. But I think we are started way before the trends comes in. So, uh, I mean, I'll be frank, I didn't do too well in that, that particular startup. But uh, uh, e-commerce now is doing very well, especially like um, share writings and uh, like delivery services, they all boom tremendously. And for enterprise solution like ourselves, uh, it also helps a lot. Um, people is, is starting to doubt that uh, are we still going to go on uh, full papers and pens and all that thing forever? Because knowing everyone knows, uh, everyone around our region is slowly going to that steps already. But we are, we, we are complacent. We are we are safe. We are always small and all that thing. But now with a lockdown, with a short period of lockdown, everyone knows about it. Like everyone is aware of that. So uh, that uh, that in terms of economies, it helps a lot in in the industry. Um, so. Um, what other question was there again? Um, let me see. Yeah, I think I think that's what I want to put out for Brunei side at least for now. Yeah. Thank you very much, Simon. And so now let's uh, continue with Arief. And the floor is yours. All right. I would like to congrat to Brunei, Simon, uh, to have hundred days COVID free without without a lockdown. So congrats. So I think uh, it's kind of a fact, it's same goes to here uh, in Malaysia, basically how all these uh, businesses, physical businesses, uh, SMEs, they, were, they are affected by, by the pandemic. So we are actually currently having uh, to face our third wave, right? So basically in Klang Valley, Selangor and Kuala Lumpur, we are in the second time of, of semi-lockdown uh, now. And then I'm saying that, uh, Everyone is affected. That there are uh, businesses that thrive during this time. There are businesses that badly affected. And I would say, how can uh, we all stay resilient and agile, right? So, 
as a as a whole concept try to adapt before we can thrive so the new situation the new normal everything is different and all that so uh, but of course uh, before we go for digitalization before we go for uh, operationally to change and all that we have to make sure that how do we keep uh, the money to, to always come in right because that's that's the fuel of, of, of a company so how do we keep uh, do have more revenue get the cash to be in faster and try to diversify let's say if you're doing uh, a shop if you're having a shop try to have a delivery from there right instead of having to just wait uh, for customers to come so try to look into that try to diversify i'm seeing a lot of companies that uh, just from selling even we're seeing a, a workshop that also sell uh, a frozen chicken right uh, here uh, in malaysia right uh, suddenly sell groceries uh, uh, a service centers a car service center selling groceries we're seeing that here in malaysia so i think do whatever you do uh, to have that cash or revenue to be rapidly increase uh, as, as fast as possible then we can look into uh, operational reform so because we have to relook really how do we work all this while right uh, face to face meeting maybe it should be like uh, we have zoom meeting now zoom is picking up right google and all that and then the way we work maybe it's not should be not just in office how do we go flexible but uh, this also have a challenge uh, in terms of let's say a shop uh, a restaurant right they cannot go mobile right they cannot go uh, they cannot eat using zoom, using zoom so how how they how they go about it right so if they have uh, if they on board into delivery so it's a totally different operational method right from having a shop people come to you and then you need to deliver uh, the, the 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 food it's totally a different kind of thing even even for us uh, we have a platform uh, so that people can drive into their workshops and we also provide a platform so that that workshop can also go out to serve their customers to that to that uh, to the customers location so we trying to have them on board and then try to push uh, you should diversify your offerings and and then this is also uh, operational reform so how can we go like attach uh, your your services or, or your offerings into uh, a digital end to end experience like how how we are doing with our platform so it's a physical shop still physical but how do we get a booking using digital platform how do we get a payment using digital platform how we get uh, the service record using digital platform so uh, i would like to spin off that point into a point number three which uh, how do we accelerate our digital adoption so that we can have better insight we can have uh, better data and then we can we can have a more uh information or data driven decision so but it's kind of challenge like it's kind of challenging to us like how do we push we don't we can't say about insights information data yet right to the smes it's about going digital uh, get uh certain little things like how can you maximize your revenue how can you have a payment contactless and all that first before we can actually push okay actually from having this digitized and digitalized you can actually have better insights uh, of your business and uh the second question uh, about the public uh, private partnership so it's kind of push here also i think not just in 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 brunei as, as uh, simon shared just now but also in malaysia we can see a lot of effort by the government trying to push uh, forward into digitalization we can see a lot of stimulus package but still execution of the of the package is most important because in terms of we are seeing a push as well not just the smes need to be pushed into uh, acceleration of digital adoption but also the government themselves so how can we offer stimulus when the stimulus package uh, stimulus package application is not also digital so operational execution is not also digital so how do we push this forward together so i think uh, a lot has been done by the by the public sector but i think there's a lot more also need to be done and can be done uh, thank you very much if uh, also for uh, uh, bringing the point uh, that uh, better data analytics uh, can actually support you know the strengthening of some of the business many of the business models of many msmes uh, across the region uh, let's continue now with uh, marco 
And what, as we were saying before, when I introduced him, uh, Marco has worked uh, with SME related issues in many different places in Southeast Asia, but also Latin America. So, and many, many more actually. So what best practices have you observed and can you share with us in terms of policies to support micro firms? And also, what can you tell us about the ILO perspective? Uh, Marco, the floor is yours. Thank you, Julia. <clears throat> so, um, well, let me start by saying that um, more than best practice, I will probably talk about uh, interesting initiatives in the sense that uh, uh, best practice involves like a sort of, uh, uh, I mean, to get to the point of calling uh, best practice or good practice, there must be probably some sort of evaluation. And the reality is that when it comes to programs, especially programs for micro enterprise, these programs have uh, not only an economic uh, uh, role and economic function of uh, supporting growth or uh, livelihood, but also a social function. For the reason we have said that uh, uh, many micro enterprises lack the, uh, the required skills uh, and, and the sort of talent uh, uh, that can uh, let them uh, grow eventually over time. And usually governments are therefore reluctant to really do an evaluation uh, of these programs. I mean, they're more likely to evaluate, for example, R&D and innovation programs where they know that, that they can show some like good results. Then uh, uh, programs supporting micro enterprise where the uh, results from a mere economic point of view or efficiency uh, might not be uh, the, the best. Uh, but there are interesting initiatives, novel initiatives that I would like to share. Um, first of all, I mean, in terms of like the HALO perspective, uh, uh, of course, the HALO, uh, the HALO, sorry, it's an uh, uh, international level organization. And so we are especially uh, interested and, uh, and careful about working conditions. And so the approach of the HALO uh, on this has been to improve productivity in macro and small enterprise while uh, in, uh, improving working conditions. How to do it? For example, by improving uh, uh, the production process and by, improving, like, the, by reducing the environmental impact of the production process, uh, which can also be dangerous, for example, for the health of workers if the production is um, too uh, polluting, so dangerous for the people, but also for the worker inside the company, uh, by improving occupational and safety uh, at uh, safety and health uh, at work um, and uh, uh, by sort of like increasing the operational efficiencies uh, of companies so for example in terms of like energy consumption and so on and we have a program uh, in the region quite uh, present which is called uh, uh, SCORE and which uh, essentially tries to do this uh, and is present in uh, Malaysia, Myanmar and uh, sorry in Indonesia, Myanmar and, uh, and Vietnam, and has achieved good results in terms of uh, productivity improvements and improvements in working conditions uh, uh, in macro and small enterprises, mostly in the manufacturing uh, uh, sector. Uh, in terms of other best pra good practice or interesting initiatives, uh, I think um, uh, if I uh, recall and I, I get back to the key uh, problems of access to skills, access to finance and access to markets, there have been interesting initiatives which have been trying uh, to target each of these problems. Uh, for example, in terms of access to finance, uh, rather than mentioning loan guarantees and credit subsidies, which were sort of like uh, traditional policies, not very innovative, um, what we see is that um, increasingly governments uh, have come up with the special tax regimes for uh, macro enterprises and for on account workers, uh, specifically meant. Uh, to uh, encourage the formalization of these companies. Uh, and the special tax regimes are usually based on a lump sum or on a fixed rate. And uh, they don't uh, use the, uh, the, the, the profits as uh, the tax base, which is the normal uh, tax base for most uh, tax regimes, but they use a simpler version or another indicator, another variable, uh, which can be uh, turnover or it can be the uh, electricity consumption. Uh, so essentially, uh, or the number of employees, the surface of, the, uh, of the, the floor space of the company. So these regimes essentially are meant to simplify the tax system uh, for micro enterprises to encourage their formalization and also to improve, of course, the cash flow position of these companies, which reduce in turn the needs for external finance, which is a problem, as we said uh, before. Um, in Malaysia, so that is a one, 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 one case. Uh, in Malaysia, I think uh, there is an interesting uh, uh, approach by SME Corp of Malaysia, which is the SME agency uh, of, uh, of Malaysia. Although now I think there has been some changes because in the region uh, they created a ministry 
of uh, uh, SMEs and startups, uh, if I'm not wrong. But at the time when we look at the, uh, at the case in Malaysia, there was a SME Corp, it was an SME agency, and it was assessing companies. It was doing a diagnostic analysis of the, of the, of the companies, giving a score uh, between zero and five based on operational efficiency, human resource management, bookkeeping, and so on. And based on the score uh, that the companies would receive, they would give uh, tailored assistance uh, to the companies. Of course, micro enterprises would usually get uh, one or two stars, and as a result, the assistance they would receive would be a more integrated uh, assistance trying to deal with the different problems we mentioned before in terms of access to skills, so trading, access to finance, maybe subsidized credit, and, uh, and so on. And finally, if I have from another region, something which was uh, very interesting in Mexico, uh, it was that the uh, program tried to address uh, all of these problems in a sort of like integrated way. Uh, it was a basic management, ma management training. So they were giving uh, six hours training. So they're not giving uh, 20, 50 or whatever, 100 hours of training. It was just six hours to improve, uh, uh, really like to, to, to correct the big mistakes that micro enterprise would normally do in areas such as uh, inventory management, uh, bookkeeping and, uh, and so on. And this would be, do, uh, would be done with a tablet that uh, they would receive, that would, the, 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 these companies would receive. These are companies mostly in uh, retail trade. Uh, and this tablet uh, re, uh, integrated uh, had a management software that they could use to improve uh, the sort of management software, for example, that uh, the, the Mr. Sue from uh, Brunei is probably trying to develop. Uh, very simple to help them really uh, manage the everyday business operation. But the tablet also had like a credit card extension so that people could uh, buy by credit card and also had a, a program to enable customers to pay for uh, the, the, the phone uh, SIM card. So essentially the idea was to help this uh, retail trade, the sort of like mom and pop shop to expand their market and to compete on a better uh, playing field with the sort of like retail chains such as 7-Eleven or in Mexico it was called OSCO, but basically the idea was to really help mom and pop shop uh, to uh, be able to better compete with these large retail chains that were eating uh, market shares of these companies, uh, which were of course uh, very often run by very low income people and uh, low educated people. Uh, and I will stop there. Thank you, Marco. That was extremely interesting. Uh, thank you very much for this perspective from different regions uh, uh, in the world. Now, let's go back to the ASEAN region uh, with the HA for the final questions before Q&A. So we know that the economic literature has extensively shown the productivity challenges of the smaller and micro firms. To continue the discussion about policies that we started with Marco, what can policymakers do to boost pro productivity of micro firms? And what can the role of ASEAN be? Ha, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Julia. Uh, I think uh, the, the policy package for micro firms should be more or less similar to the firms in general, except for some special uh, support for SMEs to improve productivity. We know that various factors affect firms' productivity. Uh, as um, Marco has mentioned to some extent, uh, the access to skills of firms' human capital uh, both uh, in terms of managerial skills, technical skills, as well as soft skills count. Then technology and innovation also contribute to productivity improvement, the use of advanced machine, the adoption of city product and process innovation. Uh, the third uh, factor uh, that has been discussed widely is the participation in the global market, either through export or GVC, can also boost firms' productivity through what we call learning by exporting. And the fourth point here in this region, we see a strong presence of FDI firms and linkage with FDI firms operating in the country is found also to be a robust channel for productivity improvement through what we call productivity spillover. And these factors affect both big firms and small firms on bit of different magnitude. And you can see that for SMEs, as Marco has mentioned earlier, um, several constraints like access to skills, access to finance, and access to market uh, tend to be uh, more serious compared to large firms. So they um, tend to have lower productivity compared to bigger firms as well. Now, based on these uh, factors, uh, what policymakers can do, I think the importance of these factors 
has been well recognized by governments and various policy actions are in place. Um, at the aggregate level or, or macro level, what we could see is the improvement of business environment, uh, for example, simplification of uh, registration procedure, uh, competition policy, um, regulatory reform, investment in infrastructure like uh, ICT infrastructure and, and digitalization. Um, in terms of human capital, uh, human resource development like improvement of education system, enhancing the quality of education services, engage more private sectors engagement, opening of FDI sector in education, or exchange programs for students and lecturers are several things that the government can think of. Um, for the uh, participation in the global market, then uh, the government should continue promoting tr free trade and FDI. Recently, there's a backlash against globalization. And countries argue that um, free trade intensifies competition at the home market and FDI crowds out domestic investment, hurting the domestic producers. So governments tend to maintain a certain level of protect protection increasingly by the form of non-tariff measures. Uh, but the cost um, protection, uh, we know the cost of society at large because it raises the price of good, uh, the lack of competition discourages firms to innovate, it limits consumers' choice of goods and services. And looking from GVC perspective, protection, let's say, for example, of steel industry can hurt car producers. And then there's the risk of retaliation. So countries should continue to promote trade uh, and FDI through trade facilitation and investment facilitation in trade cost by eliminating tariff, addressing non-tariff measures, and how trade procedure. Basically building for implementing agencies and for firmizing trade promotion market intelligence services. So the third point related to the linkage between SMEs and FDIs, it's found that the linkage is quite weak in, in some countries where the data is available. So the formation of industrial clusters through investing in infrastructure, created, creating services, links, universities, research centers, facilities for workers such, such as schools and hospitals. Um, this policy should benefit all firms, not only SMEs. Um, but uh, yeah, but um, so the gain may be distributed unevenly, but now uh, we, we see that some may gain more, some may gain less, but they improve the overall competitiveness of businesses. And uh, if we think of our policies to support a particular group of firms, for example, in this case, we're talking about SMEs, I would like to second Marco's point on the selection of SMEs. Uh, we have to recognize that not all firms operate efficiently. So some will die even with the support so policy should be selected towards firms with potential. For example, they may have some, some system of rating the firms um, for this purpose. And the final point uh, not, uh, is the availability and accessibility of firm data, particularly in ASEAN, because in order to assess the impact of policy intervention, um, data collection is necessary or we need information on and the firm's characteristics on what kind of firm received the support and we, we so that we can monitor, assess and monitor the impact of the programs. And that part is still missing in many uh, ASEAN countries. Um, for ASEAN, I think initiatives are already there, but the key thing is implementation. For broad policies, we, we talk about economic integration. Uh, they have the eyes. ASEAN Economic Community Blueprint, uh, continue to strengthen it would be important. Then they also have policies aiming particularly as, at SMEs and productivity enhancement is among the five uh, key pillars of this action plan, which should also be strengthened by, by ASEAN countries. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ha. Uh, so I think we are uh, running out of time. So we'll immediately give the floor to TJ for the Q&A session. Thank you very much, Julia. I will shoot straight into the questions. We've got one question um, that was originally posed to Arif, but I would like to throw it out to both Arif and Simon. Um, 
where you are in terms of the adoption of um, for your own business. So in the case of Arif, your platform, in the case of Simon, your SaaS solution, um, do you have you seen a greater willingness to jump onto your platform in the current environment? And do you see that the people may want to go back to the traditional ways post pandemic? If I could have you to quickly share your thoughts, perhaps for about a minute or so each. Um, let's start with Arif. All right. Uh, thank you for the question and thank you, TJ, for all, uh, for, for, for saying it, right? So basically in terms of us, uh, I will just share about what, what, what happened uh, on the 18th of March, uh, 2020, basically uh, early of the uh, quarter, quarter, quarter one of this year, right? <clears throat> so the first day of announcement of lockdown. So basically what happened is that <clears throat> normally our call, our, our call number, our, our support, support number is being called by the customers. But during that day, our support number is being called uh, by, the, by the businesses, by the workshops to try uh, to ask about how can they onboard now? How can they go uh, to do on demand now? Right? Because of the lockdown that happened. And then uh, I would just highlight about uh, the uh, one word that, that, Dr. Ha, that Dr. Dr. Ha said just now, retaliation. We have retaliation movement here. But it's not retaliation as in retaliate, but we call it retaliation. How do we uh, reconstruct or digitalization effort of auto automotive aftermarket retail? So we call it retaliation uh, itself, right? So this is the movement of us this year. So because we 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 didn't know that COVID is going to happen, but we have been planning this uh, since uh, end of last year. We did a design sprint. So what we need to do this year is how do we push digitalization of aftermarket retail. So that's what we are doing. And then one, we're seeing about openness uh, of these uh, of these of the businesses. And then another one is that uh, what uh, we just roll out the drive-in feature services that you need to drive, but you can book and call using our, our, our platform. But basically before this, it was close to impossible to have uh, the onboarding process using Zoom and Google Meet. Uh, of this workshop, but it is possible now, right? So we did it, and uh, now we are doing a hybrid. We have part of it on part of the onboarding, uh, onboarding things. We are doing it online, and part of it we are doing it offline on the ground too. And then we are doing webinar. How do we go digital and all that uh, every week? And then I think we need to think about yeah, maybe there are some of them that will go uh, to the to the to the previous normal, but we should also look into maybe this new normal. Is the permanent normal? Hmm. Maybe COVID will be like not not will go away in a short period of time, but uh, that's how we need to really uh, look into operational reform, like I shared earlier, so that we can be more agile and adaptable whatever is happening in future. Thanks very much, Arif. Uh, Simon, quickly over to you. Okay, uh, so from my side, right, Brunei, right, uh, I think overall on the COVID incidents, it actually gives a lot of positive impact to the country. Uh, being a small country from uh, Malaysian borders and all that thing, we, a lot of the spending that, that we Bruneian used to spend everywhere is now being put back to the country. Uh, and then it stimulates a lot of um, uh, positive business growth within the country. Uh, and then there's certainly we can observe quite a bit of a, um, new innovations uh, because of COVID. Like uh, we see a, a big sign of like uh, adoption of online payments, uh, adoption of uh, online meetings, and then also adoption of like um, uh, delivery services and all that thing, uh, which I think is positive. But the thing, I mean, in a good way, Brunei is safe. But also because Brunei is small, a lot of these things would not carry up the the uh, the endurance to continue after the the, the COVID. Right? So mm -hmm. for us, like we were saying, like we've been COVID free for hundred plus days. So a lot of the the online delivery thing is slowly going back to normal. Like they they don't they people like us we enjoy going out, right? So that kind of slow down the pace of the the digital adoption. 
uh, for us uh, in in our own company, um, we the first six months uh, between March onwards, right, was actually very tough because no one wants to see people, and uh, we're trying to use a lot of uh, education. I think we use that period to to do our marketing to try to strengthen. From here onward, it's going to be online, right? Even on uh, adoption rate or onboarding things, everything we try to move online. But again, because the, the COVID slowed down so much faster than we anticipated it, so everything is back to normal. So, uh, and when it get back to normal, it's very hard to push without a situation in hand. So, uh, uh, I would I would continue to push uh, to things to go online because it's actually a lot more affordable in, in a lot mm. more sense. Uh, and also, it, it get the country to move uh, with the urgency to go adoption of, of that uh, but I think at least to our products uh, it, it's okay because uh, they, they realize that this thing can come can come anytime and they as a company they do not want to take that kind of risk so um, it's time for them to change I think that one is a positive uh, I don't I, I don't think it affects us too much in, in terms of like uh, moving forward uh, the only thing is, I would love them to 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 give us the opportunity to go on full onboarding online and everything. Because in Asia, right, when people pay for our services, I know I can get everything online. But where's your guy? I want to see your guy. Like, are you coming to our office? Like, that, that's a kind of Asian mentality. So, um, in Brunei, it almost can solve that problem until it get COVID free. Now everything's back to normal, kind of. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So thanks very much, um, Simon. In the interest of time, um, allow me to just quickly wrap up a few points that I picked up from the different speakers. Um, I think when we talk about the whole agility resilience, uh, one thing that was very consistent across all four speakers was the need for innovation so that you could survive. Um, and the innovation is not just from the point of the private sector, but I think the government, the public sector also needs to innovate in terms of the policies, in terms of the support packages. Um, I like what Marco was sharing um, in terms of, you know, how, how the, even for financial stimulus packages, you need to look at things a little bit differently. Your criteria needs to be different from what it used to be. Um, education. Because you know we are talking about even within a spectrum of micro businesses, um, the education level, the awareness, the digital adoption is also very varied. How can you reach out to both ends of the spectrum so that we can bring everyone on board, um, even this whole innovation journey? Uh, infrastructure. In countries like Brunei, Singapore, probably we are a bit more blessed because we're small. But if you're talking about um, countries like Malaysia, Indonesia, where the rural urban divide is quite vast, um, I think that's where really um, a lot more public sector thought, the government, the public institutions need to think about how can you improve infrastructure? Um, again, to pick up quickly on Marco's point where, you know, even providing the small vendors with a SIM card so that they have digital access, they have access to communication that will facilitate e-payment. Things like that become important. Uh, so if you want to survive, I think for small businesses, you just got to keep thinking. You know, you cannot stop innovating, you cannot stop thinking, you cannot stop looking at what's the next new idea. Yeah. So that, you know, as a small businesses, we survived that two or three years survival rate that uh, both Dr. Ha and Marco was talking about. So with that, I want to thank you, uh, the participants, for the questions that you posed. I will hand the floor back to um, Julia. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, Marco, for replying uh, to this key, the, the questions directly in the chat because we are running out of time. I would like to thank once again all participants and all speakers for their very relevant interventions today. Uh, the discussion was probably a little bit more technical than what we generally have, but it was so rich of data, information, uh, 
good practice is an initiative coming from many different places around the world, including Mexico, as, Ma as Marco mentioned. So thank you very much again. The recording of this webinar will be soon available on our website. And we look forward to welcoming you again in two weeks' time. And we will talk about uh, women in science, technology, and engineering, women in tech and STEM. Thank you very much. Um, and we look forward to the next session. Thank you. Thank you to all speakers, Ariev, Simon, Marco, and Ha. Thank you once again.